They'll tell you it came out of nowhere, guys. They'll tell you this was sudden, but you know as well as I do, man, that volcano has been spewing things out the top of it for a long time. It's called the ACC, but it might as well be seismic in nature. Something's happening over there. We've known it's coming. It just is a little more readily apparent to everyone now. Taking many in the college football world by surprise. Jam-packed are we high atop Columbia, Missouri. We're at the University of Missouri. Going to have Eli Drinkwitz on the show for like 40 minutes tonight. It is Tuesday. It is March 19th, the year of our Lord, 2024. Yeah, if you've been at work living your life today, Clemson decided to file a lawsuit against their own conference. And here's the state of college athletics. They're not even the first in the ACC to do it over the past few weeks. So you don't really care about the goings on in the courtroom, but what's it going to mean for you? What's it going to mean on the field? Where are they going to be playing? What conference sticker will be on their helmet three years from now? We'll dive into that as best we can. Someone asked me last night, hey, just flat out, who's the most entertaining college football player you ever watched? Now, I gave my answer in passing. Then it blew up. So then I asked you guys, and then it really blew up. So I'm going to give you some submissions tonight, and I'm sure the comment section will be nice and lively. Speaking of this entire time of year, I know it's not a college basketball show. A lot of people are talking about bias, pro-blue blood, against non-blue blood. And one of you asked me about that. I thought tonight may be a good time to dive into that. All that, plus, like I said, Missouri head coach Eli Drinkwitz is going to join us, and we had a wide-ranging conversation with him, and we will give you that in its entirety uh, later as the show goes on. They're watching us in Joplin, Missouri. They're watching us in Ringgold, Georgia, Tucson, Arizona, Kingsport, Tennessee. Appreciate you guys so much. Make sure you're following at Lake Kick Josh because there's a lot we do on the road. There is access we get behind the scenes that, I'm not necessarily going to give you on the show. We don't have time, but I do have time on Instagram, for example. So make sure you're following there. Okay, let's dive in. What's happening? What's happening in the ACC? We know Florida State wants out. We now know they're not alone in wanting out. Ross Dellinger and many others reporting at the same time today. Boom, boom, boom. Clemson has filed a lawsuit against their own conference in the state of South Carolina. And you can go read it if you want to. I'm sure most of you have. It was out way earlier today. So most of you have probably read it on your lunch break or after you drove home from work. But here's the bottom line. They want out. Okay, no one no one with a large brand wants to be in the ACC anymore. Now, that's not a new headline. You know that because Florida State has been pulling at the prison bars as best they could, but so far they haven't been able to get out because those prison bars are really fortified. Or as you would call it, a grant of rights deal. But it's never been educated, as they say. It's never been challenged in a court of law. So basically, if you're in my college audience and you've never had to go through any of this and you're not exposed to any of this, there's a piece of paper, you know, somewhere in in the depths of a a vault in Charlotte, North Carolina at ACC headquarters. And it kind of says they own everyone's grant of rights and they sold it to ESPN. And so ESPN has rights to broadcast their games and all that's true. But some of them want out. Because some of them have looked at the SEC and the Big Ten and said, well, if you guys are blowing up like you are, we don't want to be left in the dust. We don't want to be like the Pac-12. God rest her soul, the Pac-12. So what if we want to be proactive? And we don't want to be left on the hook and everybody else is pulled off in the distance. Well, um, they are being told they can't get out. And so that's what this is all about right now. So I am going to tell you confidently that when Florida State started this process, I told you they're not alone. Clemson has now begun the process, and I'm going to, again, look you in a camera, and I'm going to tell you they're not alone. Uh, There's a lot that's been going on behind the scenes in the ACC. Florida State has just been louder about it, but there's been a lot of maneuvering. You know, when I talked a couple of weeks ago, I actually winked on camera. It made a lot of you uncomfortable, but I winked on camera, and I said, do you really think Florida State's the only one that's looking to get out of this conference? Well, of course they're not. Now, there was going to be some backbone required to be the first to move, but once one goes... Uh, you're going to have a domino effect. That's going to happen here. And I'm not talking about one or two other teams. I'm talking about like four or five other teams that probably want out. And at that point, what do you have? You don't have a conference unless you backfill them with inferior brands. So someone needed to be first. Florida State was first. Clemson shortly behind them, and they will not be alone. That's the first thing I'm going to tell you. The second thing I'm going to tell you is I'm going to remind you, in that show I'm talking about, I looked you in the camera again, didn't wink this time, but I said, this is not going to be several years down the road. This is going to be a matter of months. Now, all this won't be sorted out in a matter of months because nothing ever happens fast in the legal world. In fact, those folks are very incentivized to draw things out as long as they possibly can. And that's why college fans who have no interest in legalese 
learn terms like billable hours because it, it all of a sudden injects itself into our world. So it's not going to sort itself out, guys. What I was telling you and what I'm confidently now saying, look at this at, is, yeah, it was about to happen. It's been about to happen for a couple of months now, and I don't even think we're done with these headlines. I don't even think you're done reading so-and-so is filing a lawsuit against the ACC. Um, the next question is, okay, well, what's it all going to end in the result of? Are they just going to be hammered like a whack-a-mole and told, hey, stay in your lane, go play your games? We've got your grant of rights. We'll worry about all this. Are they going to get out? Is one shoe going to drop and then the entire conference dissolves? Because as you've seen, you hear rumors and rumors and rumors. But then when it finally starts to go down, this stuff happens really quick. And I think this will happen really quick. So what I'm telling you again, in case I haven't been clear, is you will know with pretty good certainty, I think by the time we play football this fall, what the fate of the future of the ACC is going to be. It won't be decided, but I think you'll have a really good idea. Uh, There is a question out there. If all of these brands were just magically free to do what they want today, if Florida State was free, if Clemson was free, if Virginia Tech, if North Carolina, if they were free, well, where would they go, Josh? Where would they go? You remember back in the day, not too long ago, really, Anyone who had this conversation always talked about media markets. In fairness, most of them had no clue what they were talking about, but they did have a map of the United States, at least the contiguous United States, and they could put little dots on a map, and they, they'd say things like, well, if this conference already has this team in this city, why would they need another team in that city? Why? They've already got the media market locked down. Well, some people still think like that. I don't think the decision makers are necessarily thinking like that. It's kind of a post-media market society and a lot more an inventory-based society, which I would argue is the way it always should have been in college athletics. But once upon a time, you worried about making sure you were in Miami and Dallas and Atlanta and St. Louis. Now, just go get the best brand you possibly can and fill your shelf with them, and people will come from across the country to sample your product. Look at what SEC television numbers do in the Seattle-Washington media market. They were uh, neck and neck with Pac-12 numbers when the Pac-12 was still a thing. And the point was, you're never going to overtake whatever the lion is in that particular region. But how many places can you be number two in? You're going to own your own footprint. How many places can you be number two? Really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, if you put Florida State versus Georgia on a field, no one in Seattle, Washington cares that you could drive from one to the other in the span of one day. Nobody cares how close together they are. What they care about is that Block G and that Seminole logo, and they care about how many future NFL draft picks are on the field, and they care about the pageantry and the tradition, etc. and it's a quality product. And so I'm not telling you unequivocally I know any of those teams are going to these conferences. That's certainly not what this show tonight's about. We will have time for that. What I'm saying is if they did... Um, or if they didn't, I don't think it's going to be because of media market, because one dot's too close to the other. The other thing, and I'll leave you with this, is I want to remind you there's a lot of hand-wringing between member institutions in the ACC and their media rights holder, ESPN. And there's a lot of hand-wringing legally between member institutions and their conference. As I've told you for months now, there is a giant lever that ESPN has the exclusive ability to pull, and it's basically a dump button for the entire thing. And they are due to make a decision on that sometime in the next calendar year. That means it could be tomorrow or it could be 11 months from now, but that would void that entire grant of rights deal. That would void the entire contract itself in year 2027. Decision has to be made by February 2025. So just remember, kids... It is a very, very tangled web right now, but we're talking about a major network that has exclusive rights to not just the ACC, but there's also this other conference that they've entered into exclusivity with starting this year, and that's the SEC. So if you've got properties over here that are being devalued and you think they'd be infinitely more valuable over here, we've seen Matchmaker happen before. It just maybe never quite to this degree or quite in this context. So that is uh, what's happened in the fun-filled world of potential future conference realignment today. Happy to have you guys with us. Thank you so much. Make sure you're subscribed, especially those of you on the podcast side, because I know a lot of you are on the YouTube side. 
and maybe you sparingly listen on the podcast side, others of you don't care about YouTube and never log in and you listen exclusively on pod, just make sure you're subscribed over there. It's free. That's all I need you to do is make sure you're subscribed. Okay, so probably one of the best questions of the modern college football era gets posed to me the other day, and it was, who do you think the most entertaining college football player is that you've ever watched? So I went Johnny Manziel just kind of like, boom, really quick. That's in my lifetime. It's, it's within just over the last decade or so. Like everyone remembers that. And plus, Johnny Manziel was a story off the field as well, thus the entertainment factor. Well, I was flying from Miami up here to Missouri last night, and I said, let me just throw this out there. And it was like 1130 at night. Most of you should have been in bed, and yet you weren't. You were up scrolling Twitter, and when you saw that, the replies flooded in. And so, yeah, we got a lot of Johnny Menzels, but uh, we got a lot of folks who went all over the place. So I'm going to pose it to you, and I'm going to give you some submissions, because certainly I could go like 10 or 15 deep on this as well. But you let me know. I think the comment section may be pound for pound as lively for this as it has been for anything we've done all year. Johnny Manziel, certainly a one-of-one football player. What I think of, in my own mind, is that Louisiana Tech game. The first year he started, um, they, they're they down late, and then they rallied like 59-57 to 57 final. I think that game, even more than the Bama game, which was to come later that fall, is what I remember because that's the first time folks went from talking about there's this gimmick-based offense and this kid running it out at College Station to saying, hey, I'm not sure that I'm looking forward to playing them. And then they lost to LSU. And so it was kind of a wet blanket on all that hype. But then they go to Tuscaloosa, and they beat Alabama. And you could make an argument, as I think the Manziel documentary did very, very effectively on Netflix, that that's one of the most consequential games in the history, in the recent history of the SEC, because it transformed Texas A&M. If you go to College Station today and you look at what is Texas A&M football, that stuff was built in a great deal because of what Johnny Manziel and then that brand became in the early portion of the 20 teens. Cam Newton, a few years before that, we're going to talk to Eli Drinkets later in the show. Eli was on that Auburn staff in 2010. And uh, oh, the stories that anyone could tell. Because Cam Newton not only comes in and he's out of Blinn Junior College and he's going to Mississippi State. Oh, wait, no, he's going to Auburn. And so you've got the whole how did Auburn get him angle. And then everyone's got a sly grin on their face because they all think they know. And then the NCAA joins the party. And so there's this year-long kind of subtext of, hey, Auburn's still undefeated another week. Yeah, they, they, they snuck by another week. They had like six or seven one-possession wins. Everyone kept thinking next week's the week they fall off. But there's this 6'6 six, six alien-looking quarterback they have that keeps getting better. Now, how'd they get him? We don't know. The NCAA's investigating, so you've got that backdrop. You've got Cam Newton getting better. And then Bama is in the middle of what becomes the Saban dynasty, but they lose a couple of games. So Bama, in a rare move, is out of the national title picture that year, but Auburn's undefeated. And you know the Iron Bowl's coming up. And so Bama kind of redefines their goals, and it's let's make sure we take a crowbar to the kneecaps of what's happening down at Auburn. And they did for the better part of two quarters. They get up 24-0, and then uh, Auburn decides to make the second half theirs. And 28-27, to I believe, was the final. And uh, so you've got, from an entertainment standpoint, people who were agnostic to college football, totally invested in the Cam Newton Auburn season. Before then and after then, Gene Chizik's career, uh, very forgettable as a head coach at Auburn, but he was the head coach that year. Michael Vick, early 2000s, total like video game mode at Virginia Tech. And it's so like antithetical. If you think about the traditional Virginia Tech approach under Frank Beamer, it was it was special teams, it was hard-nosed defense. And then all of a sudden, there's this kid from Virginia the state of, named Michael Vick, because he wasn't Mike yet, he was just Michael Vick. And he goes there, and he's doing stuff that really made you sort of recalibrate how you thought about football. I remember hearing my dad talk about this one time. He said, you know, I've come to define in my own mind what it takes to win. You know, here are the things that win. Here are the things that lose. But you've calibrated all that based on the mold of a normal quarterback. And you have what what is normal, and then you have a scale of how good or great is a normal quarterback. Mike Vick wasn't normal. And so he comes in, and you find yourself asking, wait, can Virginia Tech, can they win a national title with him? And they came close. They got to the game itself. Uh, but 
you don't name many other guys off that Virginia Tech team, do you? You name Michael Vick. And then, of course, he goes on to do it in the NFL as well. Barry Sanders is the only guy I went back to the 80s for. I could easily do Bo. I could do Boz. I could do Herschel. Uh, but I think a lot of you in our audience are a little bit younger, so you named newer guys. But I really implore you, you've seen plenty of Bo and Herschel, especially if you grew up where I grew up. I don't know that a ton of you have watched Barry Sanders' 1988 season. 2,628 yards and, 20, and 37 touchdowns. He did it in 11 games, guys. Also, um, I mean, obviously you remember him with the Lions and you watched what he did in the NFL. I don't think enough people go back and watch him in college. That's, it's just a way of movement. It's a way of elusiveness that I don't think I've ever seen any other back feature. Um, Barry Sanders, also a one-of-one one kind of guy. Tyron Matthew in that 2011 season with LSU, I think, fit this description. If you're talking most entertaining, because you, you got the Honey Badger nickname attached to him very early on, and a lot of us were aggravated by it. I hated it. I didn't know what one was, and I hated it. And it, it really aggravated me that it seemed like there was this aura or mystique that he took on more so than just let's focus on his play on the field. But then again, this is an entertainment-based industry, and so that's what people do. But, you know, he was in a secondary where you, you had like Eric Reed in that secondary. There were people, there were people around LSU who would legitimately argue with you. Matthew, pound for pound, is probably the third best DB talent they had in that secondary. You know what? They may be right. But in terms of pure entertainment value, you were watching where he was at all times. He's very effective in punt return as well. So I buy that. I absolutely buy Lamar Jackson. If you just snap your fingers, say Lamar Jackson at Louisville, where does your mind go? It's got to be that Clemson game. I've got the numbers written down here. You want to talk about a paper popper of a game. 27 of 44, threw for nearly 300 yards. He ran it 31 times for 162. That's not over the course of a season. A lot of times when a guy's effective with his arm, and I give you his rushing statistics, he'd have like 31 for 162 over a season. Lamar had 31 for 162 that night on the ground and also threw for nearly 300, and they lost because that was against Deshaun Watson's Clemson. So that's what I think of with him. Got Tavon Austin. ton of you went to the West Virginia well and talked about Tavon Austin, two-time All-American. In 2012, this is kind of similar to Lamar, different position. He had 1,290 receiving yards, had 643 rushing yards, and uh, also returned punts and returned kicks. Vince Young, yes. Kyler Murray, yes. Uh, Jameis Winston, yes. Deion Sanders, before any of their times, yes. Darren McFadden, I selfishly put on there because I remember watching Arkansas uh, one, one day in person and him and Felix Jones, and it was just as violent as I've ever seen anyone run the football in college. And I probably still stand by that. I've watched Derrick Henry as well. Uh, Darren McFadden was just terrifying to watch. And that was back when... You could play them a little different, and, and yet it was guys on the other side that still kind of were wobbly-legged when it was him they were having to go against. Normally nowadays and even back then, it was offensive guys that were worried because of what defenders were allowed to do to you. Uh, that kind of turned it on its ear. So I am very much looking forward to how wrong that list is and how many guys' names I left out, and that's what it's all about because that's what God created March for. All right, uh, one more question here, and I'm going to get to the sit-down we had with Eli Drinkwitz. Really, really good stuff. I, I don't care if you're a Missouri fan or an Oregon fan. There's a lot of good stuff in there for a college football fan. So one of you asked me about Blue Bloods. And this is the time of year. It's the NCAA basketball tournament starting, but it's also the time of year where we start to look ahead to the next college football season and rankings will start to come out. And inevitably, you'll hear people talk about how the system is biased towards blue blood programs. And you're not wrong. You're not wrong about that. I'm kind of hard to nail down on this. It's funny I got asked this because I'm kind of hard to nail down on it because I like major brands. They move the needle for us. They make us a lot of money. Um, in a very self-centered aspect, the bigger brands doing good are good for our show. Everybody in media will tell you that. However, at the same time, I love attaching ourselves any given year to smaller branded teams that are making runs. I'd probably be the same way in basketball. For example, I think it's absurd that there's even discussion right now of doing away with the model in the NCAA tournament where you have the auto bid. I hate auto bids in college football. So like I said, 
is trying to nail Jello to the wall to get me to be consistent on this. Um, it's kind of case by case for me. But as for college football and as for the preferential treatment those big brands get, I think people sometimes get mad at other people who are making decisions just like they would if they were in that position. Now, in my world, that's you have a college football show, you look at the numbers, and when you talk Alabama or Texas, you get a whole lot more viewers tune in than when you talk Northwestern. Well, that can make you mad, but yet I am confident if you were in this chair, you'd end up doing the same thing. Well, if you were running a television network, would you lean in? If you were, if you were producing studio coverage, would you have your on-air talent lean in? If you were running editorial for a major website, would you have your writers lean in on big brands more so than obscure brands? The answer is probably yes, unless you wanted to run a nonprofit, in which case more power to you. But what I like about college football is the success you have long-term in college football is not always tied to size of media market, which is way different than pro sports. Major League Baseball I grew up a Braves fan, but also I liked Oakland because I was watching Oakland in the early 2000s and also liked the color scheme. Still do. It's a shame what's happened to the organization. But it's a small market organization. Nothing was ever going to change that is the point. And in pro sports, you have baked in advantages if you're in one of the big five media markets versus if you're in one of the markets 20 to 25 on the meter. In college football, Look where the superpowers are. Like Clemson won back-to-back titles parked in Clemson, South Carolina. Uh, Alabama has been perhaps the greatest dynasty in the history of the sport, and they've done it multiple times, and they're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So here's where I'm conflicted on this. If you wanted to just open your eyes in the here and now and tell me, hey, Alabama's gotten preferential coverage and treatment for a long time, you're dead on the money. What I would just do and what I choose to do is I'd ask, why? Are they getting it? And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to look at programs and groups of people that 75 or 100 years ago decided we're going to take this thing seriously. We're going to prioritize it. We're going to invest in it. Uh, we're going to market it. We're, everyone is going to understand that we're just a freight train. We're moving the same direction, and it's about football. And I don't care if we're in College Station, Texas, Columbia, Missouri, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, wherever we are, that's what we're going to take seriously. If you do that decade over decade and you build up that equity, to me, you're going to have bias in your favor. You've probably been successful over multiple years. Why would I be mad at that? I'd be mad at it if my program hadn't done the same thing or I was new to the party and I didn't get that treatment. But really, I'm not, I'm not mad at the outside. I'm not externally mad. I'm mad at the inside. I'm mad we didn't do long ago what those guys did. So, yeah, it exists. Um, to answer the question, I acknowledge it. I acknowledge we, I participate in it. Not even we. I participate in it. I just question if you'd act the same way. And I question who are you really mad at when that bias starts to weave itself into narratives or coverage or whatever it is you want to talk about. I appreciate also that I can go over and visit our friends at FanDuel. And yeah, I could look at a big brand name, but I could also look at Oklahoma State if I wanted to. And I could, I could place friendly wagers. I could use their numbers to use on my friends to place wagers. But the futures market is really fascinating now over at FanDuel because you got conference winners over there. You've got individual games that you could wager on. Certainly, you have win totals. And, by the way, like I have it on very good authority, there's a sizable college basketball tournament that cranks up this week, and all the numbers are there. It's the exclusive odds provider, FanDuel is, of this show. We sincerely appreciate them. They make, uh, they've made a little possible already for us at the tail end of last year. They will make a ton possible for us. And I don't even care if you've never bet a dime in your life nor do you plan on betting a dime in your life. I'm talking about from an entertainment and functionality standpoint on this show, they're going to make a ton possible for us this fall. So come one, come all, as far as I'm concerned. We appreciate them. Also appreciate uh, Ryan and Coach Drinkwitz and everyone has welcomed us with open arms here in Columbia today. And uh, we have never had Eli Drinkwitz on the show. And I thought, well, it's probably time to change that. So we sat down earlier today with Missouri head coach Eli Drinkwitz, and he had a lot to say. Check it out. So it's, I mean, I'm looking at the calendars around here. It's, it's mid to late March. Yeah. 
some schools out there are diving into spring ball. You guys are done with spring ball already. Right. And rumor on the street is you had pretty decent weather up here. You had to use the indoor like <laughs> twice. Yeah. So I don't know how that works out. But what's the methodology behind choosing to go that early for spring? There's a lot of different reasons. It, it starts with player safety. Um, anytime you divide spring practice over spring break, most people get a few in and then they give everybody a nine-day layoff and then they come back and practice. Um, research says that that's the greatest opportunity to injure your players. And so, you know, we try to reduce that. Um, our spring break is the last week in March. So it gives us an opportunity to get all of it done before March. Don't put them in that uh, risk uh, as far as injury. But then it allows us to figure out, okay, this is what we have, this is where, we at, where we're at, and this is five months of uninterrupted training to get better. And we utilize April uh, with spring access through the NCAA for walkthroughs. We, we use uh, June for OTAs, uh, and our strength coach is allowed to, to really get our guys right. And, and you, look, you think about the college football cycle, there's really not another time period where you can get four to five months of uninterrupted training. Uh, for your guys, and so as a as a you know developmental program, a group that do, you know we pride ourselves on really getting our players better and finding different ways to to improve them not only fundamentally but speed, athletic movements. Um, this is the best way, most effective way for us. So I think typical fans they see you they see you win the Cotton Bowl, which we'll talk yeah. about in a little while. Then they you get a little break, then you go into spring ball, then you got this long break, mm -hmm. and they don't really check back in with you maybe until media days or fall camp starts. And there's this great unknown of like, what is Eli Drinkwitz doing on a random Tuesday <laughs> in June? I know, I know a lot of you guys interact with other staffs. Yeah. Some of you even get out on the road and go visit with other staffs. And you've, of course, got a million and one things going on behind the curtain. So like we peek behind that curtain and I look at your schedule for the next five months. What's some yeah. of the stuff on there that a normal Tiger fan in Jefferson City never would have guessed you'd be doing? Whew. Well, probably taking my kids to school. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that we love to do as a staff in April when spring ball's over is we bump our staff meetings back to 8.15 in the morning so the coaches can, can make sure they can take their kids to school. I think it's important for us to, to try to have some semblance of balance uh, with our families. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's typically what you think. You know, our mornings we spend recruiting, uh, evaluating tape, and then in the afternoons we spend time on ball. Um, we'll do a staff retreat in April. Uh, I think I've got at least 10 caravan dates where we're going around Jeff City. Or we're actually going to Jeff City. We'll go to Chicago. We'll go to Dallas. Um, we'll go to different cities and, and promote Tiger football. Um, and then in June, man, it's, it's camp season. You know, uh, we have all kinds of little kids camps, evaluation camps, travel camps, uh, going and seeing, you know, what are the future prospects for the Tigers. Um, play a little golf as far as, you know, Tiger caravans. We'll, we'll do some, some golf outings um, and some fundraising. And, and, and then we'll squeeze in some time, you know, Tuesday afternoons. We do individual with our players. Uh, Wednesdays during June, we do brotherhood and ball. A lot of different things. And then Fridays, we have uh, Elite Edge Fridays where we'll, we'll, we'll do some specific training uh, for those guys and for our team, team building. So you mentioned the word there, fundraising. Yeah. And it's always been baked into the head coach's job, but it's really, really, really it's baked into the head coach's <laughs> yeah. job now. Yeah. So um, no one wants to sound like they're complaining on the record about anything ever. Yeah. Behind the scenes, one of the most consistent bits of feedback that I've gotten from you guys, and I'm talking about coaches, specifically at the head coaching position, is, man, there is a disproportionate amount of weight with NIL placed on us to spearhead fundraising. Yeah. And it, it has nothing to do with coaching ball. It has nothing to do with developing my guys. But yet I got 24 hours in a day and bigger and bigger, that chunk on the pie chart gets dedicated to things that are way, way off the field and out of this building. Where's your mind on all that? Well, it's a competitive advantage to win, right? And it's within the framework of the rules to, there's, there's no limit to what you can provide your student athletes through NIL except what you can fundraise. So for us, it's it's what can I do to give our team, our program, our players the best advantage to try to win a championship. And it's just like anything else. Like if it's up to me to get it done, then I'm going to try to do everything within my power every waking second to figure out, okay, what what is it we can do? What phone calls can we make? What are the ends that we have? Is there a, a Fortune 500 business in the state uh, of Missouri that's a, that's a Tiger alum that we can get a hold of to see if we can spark a passion or interest 
Um, because again, like it, it is the, it is the fuel to success right now. And so, you know, I think for me, it's just one of those things that, uh, if, if it gives us a, a competitive advantage, man, then I owe it to our team and I owe it to this university and our program to do everything possible to try to, to maximize it. So if I went to Missouri in 1993 and I've gone on to make fortunes in whatever sector, whatever industry I've never even heard of, but I'm kind of cold on football, I've never been involved, yeah. and you call me and you, you try and light that fire and you try and open my checkbook a little bit more and bring my interest up a little bit more, how similar does that feel to a recruiting call or, or a recruiting process? It's very similar. Um, you know, I think that's the, that's the thing about recruiting and that's the thing about fundraising is you try to figure out what do they know about the University of Missouri and how can I tie their experience or past thought processes into uh, the university. You know, I think recruiting really established is based on three things. It's, it's based on relationships. Um, it's based on selling. You're either selling what you've done in the past or what you plan to do in the future. And then it's about having a unique on campus experience, something that they haven't done anywhere else. You know, you don't want to go to a cookie cutter visit to, uh, Missouri to, to, Ole Miss to Georgia, you know, you got to distinguish yourself somehow. And so it's just really the same thing in fundraising. You know, there was a, somebody that, that we were able to, to really develop a strong relationship with in the fundraising department hadn't really been uh, associated with the university for a while. But when I sat down and had breakfast with him, you know, it was tied back into, he remembered when we beat Notre Dame <laughs> three to nothing back in the seventies, or when we went to beat USC or the first time that we beat Nebraska, uh, you know, and so at that point, it was about stirring the echoes of of, of his uh, fandom and, and trying to get him back involved. When you came here from App State, I'm always curious with any coach who takes over a new job, how long does it take you to get that place to mm -hmm. understand the stuff you're talking about? Like what mattered to some of these people in the 70s? Yeah. What is the program today? What could it be like? How How long does it take to fully immerse yourself in that? Yeah, I, I think that was actually one of the things that I, I misjudged uh, becoming the head coach here was how long it would take me. And, and every place is uniquely different. It has its own unique story. And, and the same things and approaches that I had that worked for me at Appalachian State weren't going to work here. And I didn't realize that until after I was like, OK, this is this this uh, direction's not going to go. Um, you know, I, I think in every place has its own stories and, and unique fabric. It's it's. I don't know if there's a timetable on it, right? But I do think after my second year, I felt more and more comfortable about, okay, these are the people, these are the key stakeholders in the university, these are the key stakeholders in the program, this is the, the history of the university, this is what we can sell, um, these are some things, these are areas that we can work on, um, and, and this is the excitement about the future. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really kind of where we're at right now is a little bit of success that we had last year gives us uh, an excitement about, okay, this place can be all the things that we've dreamed about. And and we've got a roadmap of how to do it. Now we've got to consistently put those things in place. If you would have sketched out on a pizza box for me when you took the job, here's how I think it's going to go. Like, here's how I think I'm going to do it and yeah. I'm going to be able to do it. How much of that has a line through it now and how much of it's been consistent and we've adhered to it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's like that old... Uh, tweet you see where the like everybody thinks the line of success is like this and then it's yeah. really like this that would be the story i mean i thought oh shoot day day i step foot <laughs> on here man we'll get this thing cranking and it was really like man highs and lows and and um I, you know i think about um some of the excitement from year one right when we beat um uh, we beat lsu right out here the defending national champion uh you know, on the last play of the game, we beat Arkansas with a game ending kick. We beat, uh, Kentucky out here. You know, those, those were unbelievable moments. But then I think about the next year, the lows of just getting smoked at home by Tennessee, um, losing the bowl game. You know, I, it, there were tremendous highs and tremendous lows, but it was our ability to continue to believe in the process. I think, you know, one of the guys that I attribute the most to our ability to succeed was, uh, is Ryan Russell our director of athletic performance, his ability to be consistent in his approach and in his ability to preach, hey, this is going to be our success. We just have to stick with it. Um, and his faith in the process, along with our faith in our process, I think really pushed us into the su success that we've had. So let me ask you this. You're the one ultimately that's tasked with casting the vision for the organization. Yeah. So things aren't going to go well every day, mm -hmm. yet you have to adhere to the process. Yeah. 
but you also have to understand when to change something. Mm -hmm. So where's the balance of things didn't go well today, but don't worry, we're not linear, but overall our trajectory is right versus no, we need a course correction in this department or that compartment. Yeah, I think for me, um, it really came down to, I believe strongly in our core values. I believe strongly in being a developmental program. I believe strongly in how we recruit the right fit for our program. But sometimes the X's and O's and the strategies need to change. Uh, and for me, personally, it was about giving up play calling uh, and being more involved in the day-to-day uh, of our players' lives and be more involved in the day-to-day -day of, of getting fundraisers and going out and recruiting and getting the players here and empowering our coaches to have more X's and O's success. I, I, I just wasn't able to put the time that I needed to in into all facets of the program. You know, when you're the offensive coordinator at a school or the quarterback's coach, you can really focus in on just this area. And, and when you become the head coach, you're in charge of all of it. And you can't shun your responsibilities like I was of being the offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach for other successes um, or, or other job responsibilities. And so when I was looking back at, okay, what do we have to change? What, what are some things... You know, I actually had written it down in my journal, man. We got to turn everything upside down and figure out, you know, after we'd lost to Wake Forest, like we got to look at everything and see, you know, what what is it that's really good and what is it that's got to that's got to be changed. And ultimately that arrow just came right back to me. Like I had to change. I had to do something different because the core values were good, because the players in our program were good, because I believed in the process of what we were doing in the weight room. I felt like, okay, that could be just a little change that could have a dramatic success. How long have you kept a journal? Uh, well, honestly, since 2010, uh, when I went down to Auburn as a GA, um, I was like, you know, I'm going to just write some different things that have occurred. Just that was to a see. really good year to start journaling really at a really good, good place. Yeah, really good year, uh, especially with all the different things. In fact, <laughs> I've actually told Chiz I kept every one of our staff notes, and, and uh, I have it in a in a bundle. He wants to look back at it at some time. I just haven't sent it to him yet, but. It's interesting when you look back and see the, the highs and lows from college football, man. Uh, of course, that season there was a lot of highs, but it, it's it's a unique journey for sure. What would be the most, outside of the 2010 Auburn, yeah. what would be some of the most interesting chapters in there? Because it's going to be a book one day, so let's just go ahead and talk <laughs> about it. What would be the most interesting oh, chapter man. so far? Uh, boy, there all, there's all kinds of interesting chapters. I, I think probably one of the mo ones that really defines uh, my career is uh, I've been hired at, at Arkansas State. We win the conference championship. Coach Malzahn accepts the job at Auburn. All right, um, they hire somebody that I've never met before, have no connection to, it, Brian Harson at Arkansas State. I, I really have three different scenarios going on right there. I could go back to my hometown, be the, the head football coach, um, which would have paid a lot of money. I could have gone to Auburn in an off-the-field role, or I could really try to get a job at Arkansas State. And so, man, I put everything I had into trying to get a job at Arkansas State. In fact, I, I turned down the, the head football job at Alma. I told Coach Malzahn I wasn't going to go to Auburn, and I put everything into getting that job. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, Coach Harson gave me an opportunity, interviewed me, waited about five days, and called me when I was going back home for Christmas uh, to celebrate Christmas before we left for the bowl game. And and offered me a job, and really, ultimately, that that changed the trajectory of, of my career. And so I think that was probably the most um, gut-wrenching time period for me uh, in coaching college football. You ever keep that in mind when you're hiring guys? And and, and how long it takes? But I know it's a process. Yeah. Like, you've got to go through the process, yeah. but at the same time, guys are just waiting. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, when, you, when you get in these roles, you start realizing that there's a lot of different aspects to – hiring and firing people or moving on or giving opportunities and, and it's it's a real challenge because there's a lot more people affected than just the people in our building um, there's 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 a lot of lives being affected and, and usually kids lives and and it's a lot it's a lot but at the end of the day you know Chiz used to tell us this all the time as the head coach his loyalty was to Auburn and his loyalty was to the university that's what they hired him to do and I think one of the challenges that I've had as a head coach is separating um, personal relationships from professional relationships and, and um, being able to separate friendship from business and holding people to a standard um, and not uh, allowing you know those lines to be blurred. So 
I was watching you recently, and you did you did the podcast. Give me the title of it again. Think like a farmer. Think like a farmer is set up amazing. Like aesthetically, yeah. that thing's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Maple Ranch. Yeah, and um, it's twice now. I've tried to remember the name of it on air, and very unprofessionally, I've forgotten it. That's so, okay. so that's why we brought you on the show today. Yeah. We appreciate it. Um, you talked about the thing with you and Heupel, and everyone grabbed onto it. You also threw a little apology out there for Dan Mullen, and no one grabbed onto it. <laughs> and did that surprise you at all? Yeah, that surprised me. Uh, I think I've visited this whole Tennessee stuff enough. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I felt like looking back, um, there was something that, that was uh, said in a radio interview that was, you know, not, not fair to Coach Mullen. I have a lot of respect for Coach Mullen, and I think he did an outstanding job at Florida, and I think he's a very professional, good football coach and a good man. And so, you know, I wanted to apologize to him if that got taken out of context or uh, so, yeah. And I was surprised that it really didn't hit the Internet. But, you know, may maybe this will keep yeah. this. Maybe this will keep Dan from ranking us so low <laughs> or picking against us, you know, now that he's at ESPN. But that's how the media is. <laughs> yeah, the, the media they hold be grudges, man. <laughs> they hold grudges. When um, when you guys go down to Destin or when you're when you're in a room physically with all the SEC head coaches, yep. There's never cameras. No one gets to go in there. Yeah. And so there's like this theater of the mind that builds up with a lot of folks about what the vibe must be like inside that room. What's the vibe in a room full of SEC head coaches? Um, before the meeting starts, it's very relaxed. It's it's very candid. It's it's funny. Yeah, forget about uh, all that stuff. And then the meeting starts, and then what happens? Well, then Lane shows up, yeah. you know, in his jogger short, yoga <laughs> jogger pants. And, and who knows? It goes off the rails at that point. No, it's it's very professional. I mean, you got some of the greatest minds in college football in a room. And at the end of the day, especially now in the meetings that I've been at, we're all trying to do the very best we can, not only for our universities, but for the game of college football. And I felt like, you know, last we, this past year at winter meetings, um, you know, we, we had some very serious conversations about the recruiting calendar. And I felt like, man, as a collective group, we did as good a job as any meeting that I had been in about offering solutions. In fact, I think um, um, Coach Napier had the best idea, and, and we all kind of ran with it about moving up signing day to the first Wednesday and making December a dead period so that um, we could eliminate this speed speed of getting into the portal. You get into the portal so quick because people were trying to go on visits. But if you make December dead, then we're able to allow our teams to finish the bowl season, finish college football playoffs. And if you make January the time that guys will go out and figure out where they're going, you know, you might reduce the stress on the coaches. So, man, I felt like all of us, you know, kind of had um, some good ideas in that and pushed it. Um, Coach Smart's on the Rules Oversight Committee, um, you know, that he was sitting in the room and, and telling – we have an SEC head coach's text thread, and he was telling us, like, hey – this rules up. What is everybody's take on it? So I think more now more than ever, we're really trying to work together for the game and, and try to do what's best again for the SEC and for college football. There's still times where you know we we do have some arguments and some some pushback about what's best for maybe my school versus what's best for their school. Um, one of them was about un, unbalanced formations. What's best for the offensive side of the ball versus <laughs> what's best for the defensive side of the ball. But for the most part, it's it's pretty professional what about the um what about that calendar change you just talked about it yep. for a second i know a lot of us in our world in the college football world we're paying attention to oh there's going to be a signing date right in the middle of conference championship week but a lot of the high school guys are looking at the really really early signing date and they're asking what's this going to do to a senior year of a high school kid i've sat in those symposiums i've listened to all the ideas there is no perfect idea no so in terms of the negatives with the new setup, how serious do you think that is? High school coaches concerned about what early, early commitments may do and early signings may do to their kids' senior seasons. Yeah, ultimately, I was a high school football coach. That's that's what I was, what I got into, why I got into it. Uh, helped about 24 players go play Division One football over the course of my time. Um, I'm absolutely against the June signing period. I think it's uh, it speeds everything up. Coach Saban talked about this for as long as he was in those meetings. Every time we move something up, we just expedite the time with which recruiting begins. We've already got where now June or January you can actually have visit, you know, you, know, you can visit with somebody in a school. You basically are doing uh, home visits just at the school. Uh, you know, if somebody start has the ability to sign in June, 
They're going to start asking about getting NIL, which is legal in some states, including my state, right? You're also going to have guys, you know, really when December signing period began, that's when you started seeing guys early enrollee. And now it's become the norm. Yep. And so, again, you're fast-forwarding the track of a senior. They're never going to get this time back. Their senior year in high school is some of the best time of their life. And they're they're not going to go to prom. They're not going to get that to to, to to play for state championships in basketball, and baseball, and wrestling, and track. Um, but I think if you start doing it in June, you're going to start getting guys reclassified. We're already starting to see that. It's become it's going to become more of a norm. Are you going to start seeing guys opt out of their senior years in high school? Right. Then what happens when coaches coaching changes happen? So I just think that the 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 negatives far outweigh the benefit. Again. Are we doing it for the student athlete or are we doing it for college football? And, and I think those questions don't get weighed enough, right? Like if we're doing it truly for the student athlete, then make it make sense. But none of those negatives are better for the student athlete. They're all better for whatever coach gets the, you know, oh, well, now we can have July vacation. Come on, man. Like, <laughs> What's best for the student athlete? What's best for the high school coach? And, I, again, those, those student athletes, those players, those coaches are the collateral damage for us. And, and I, that, for me, is why I'm against it. You know, moving it up the first Wednesday in December, again, that could have an impact on the conference championship teams, right? But you can't legislate college football based off of two teams uh, or – Eight teams. How many power conferences do we have now? At yeah, four. four so I, yeah. yeah, so eight teams. No, something like that. You know, in the NFL, the better you do, the more you get punished in the in the draft process. Yeah. In college football, you don't really have that. And so I heard one person the other day put it this way: If the closest you come to getting punished for success in college football is you got to worry about signing your next top five class as you get ready to play a conference title game. Peanuts compared to what the pro guys do. Love and that. I listened to it and I said, number one, I'm going to steal it. Yeah. And number two, it actually makes sense. Yeah. Well, so again, the NFL has mastered the market of making sure that they're relevant year round, right? And the most success, the more success you have, um, they, they penalize you in the draft. But what people have failed to realize in this new college football playoff model and, and, and what we're trying to do is in the NFL, there's 32 teams and 16 teams make the playoffs. The other 16 teams either sell a new coach or they sell they, they're getting the top five draft pick. In college football, what are we selling to the other, uh, again, if we're saying that there's 136 Division One playing schools and only 12 make the playoffs, what are we selling to all these other fan bases to keep them actively engaged? And that's where I'm a little bit concerned right now because, um, you know, in the NFL, a nine and seven team is going to make the playoffs. Yep. And so everybody's, oh, we, we're tired of seeing these six and six teams in, in bowl games. We're not tired of seeing eight and eight teams or nine and seven teams in the playoffs. So again, we're not celebrating the success. I think the bowl games are, are really important to the student athlete experience, but they're really important to keeping the fans engaged to what I consider the greatest game. In, in, in the world, in my opinion, is college football because it it, it really uh, is deep down in the fabric of the United States. I mean, it, it's it gets into the communities. You know, NFL again is great, but it's 32 major cities, right? College football gets into. I mean, at the again at the University of Missouri, we're the only Division One playing school in the state. We we, we touch around seven million people's lives. We have uh, alumni bases in Kansas City and St. Louis and you know St. Joe and, and Cape Girardeau. Right, you you go to states like New Mexico. They their team made the the NCAA tournament right now. I mean, there's two million people that are fired up. They don't have anything else. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't have a uh, 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 NBA team, an NFL team, an NHL team. They they have and there are other their universities. Yeah, there are other famous places. The government won't even let them go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that's one area that I'm a I'm a little bit concerned as we continue to chase the dollar um, from a business aspect. Um, we we better be sure that we keep the most important people that make our, our sport so great, the fans, engaged. How, how often do you find yourself watching decisions get made, conferences get realigned, playoff gets expanded, you see billions of dollars in the new TV deal, and it's directly impacting you because you're a head coach of a major college football program, but maybe you look at it and say, I don't even know what went into that. It's not going to impact what I do the rest of my work day here, so it just is what it is. Or do you try and stay looped in enough to where, hey, if your cousin asks you about it, you sound informed on it. Well, I try to stay as looped in as possible because I think, again, you're, you're always trying to find the best competitive advantage that you have, right? 
Um, I think the challenge is when decisions are being made about things, a la NIL uh, or transfer portal or recruiting calendar, and the input that you had was totally ignored. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where you get that. That's where the frustration begins for me. Um, and I know our commissioners are trying to do the best they can, but they have very limited expertise in what we actually deal with on a day to day basis. Um, and it's the same really with, with athletic directors and the heads of the NCAA. Like they're not boots on the ground. Right. If you look at Colin Powell, when he talks about leadership, boots on the ground impact the decisions. Right. Because they actually know what's going on. And I think a little bit in the NCAA and a little bit in, in what decisions are being made, um, there's not enough expertise in, in, in the actual day-to-day of what's going on uh, when the decisions are being made. I think I've had about a million folks, you may be a million and one, say the last voices being taken into account when making football decisions are football people's voices. Yeah. And it sounds like that's the sentiment that you pretty much feel as well. Well, again, I, I look at, and it's not just about football, right? You look at some of the conference realignment. Those are football-based decisions that are affecting a lot of other sports, right? When we talk about, I mean, you and I off camera, we're talking about Cal joining the ACC, you're talking about Oregon being in the Big Ten, Washington being in the Big Ten. That's all great. That's all awesome. Those are football-based decisions. Uh, but what about the other sports that are fixing to have to, all the travel, all the different things that impact those student-athletes? Were those were those student athletes considered in the decision making process? If they were, and that's the best decision made, great. I'm just asking the question: Was were they thought about? Um, and as we continue to move forward in this unprecedented time of college football and college sports in general, I'm not complaining at all. I, th- I think I think what I've seen from our student athletes, from our football players, and how they greatly benefit from NIL. Man, I'm pro NIL as all get out. I want them to earn as much as possible. I just want to make sure that we try to keep um, every student athlete's experience the best that it possibly can be. I've talked on our show a lot about Blake Baker, Kevin Peoples, and those, yeah. those guys just went to LSU, and it was part of, for my money, one of the most underrated staffs in the country last year. Yeah. M- magazine culture is really good at emphasizing what you lose. Players and yeah. coaches, what did you lose? Maybe not so much focus on how did you backfill it, yeah. what do you have? So. Walk me through backfilling those positions and how you feel about the staff you have now. Yeah. First off, absolutely have a ton of respect for Blake Baker and Kevin Peoples and the job that they did for us for the past two seasons. Uh, Would not have had the success that we had without those guys. But any program is bigger than any one or two individuals, and you hope that, um, that those guys have all the success in the world moving forward. But I'm also a firm believer that we were a part of their success, too. Um, our culture, our environment had a direct impact and effect on the ability for them to shine in the light that they did. And so, uh, you know, when those guys moved on, wish them the absolute best. But at that point, it's about us finding who is the right fit for us and, and who's going to fit what we do and who can actually improve us, right? Because at any point when you have adversity or people leave, it's an opportunity for you to improve the condition that you have. And so, there were some things that, hey, we all have weaknesses, right? And so, hey, what are the weaknesses that those coaches had, and how can I go find somebody that can can improve them? Um, and I really felt like, you know, I was doing my due diligence on interviewing for defensive coordinators. I really felt like Corey Batoon uh, did an outstanding job from a technical aspect as a safeties coach. Had two All-Americans last year at South Alabama. If you look at the statistics of him as a defensive coordinator at South Alabama over the past three years, there may not have been a better, not only in group of five, but all of college football, the, the amount of success that they had. So if you look back at the success he had had at Ole Miss, the success that he'd had, uh, it made it a really good candidate for somebody to come in with something to prove, right? And again, when you look at the success that we've had from a coaching staff and from a player standpoint, all of us had something to prove, had a little chip on our shoulder that, hey, man, with, with this opportunity, I'm going to prove to the rest of the football world who we really are. And so when I got a chance to interview Corey and sat in front of him, heard his story, uh, you know, really dialed in the X's and O's, I thought, man, this is, this is the right fit for us at the right time. Uh, it was an easy transition from a defensive schematic standpoint. They run some very similar defenses. Um, I think his... Uh, 
uh, knowledge and tech, technical skills from the safety position have really translated. I think in spring I saw a huge jump in Joseph Charleston, Dalen Carnell, Marvin Burks, Trevez. I think all those guys improved significantly, not only in their man-to-man skills, but their footwork, their, their zone recognition. Um, so very excited about what he's adding to our team. Defensive ends, man, um, golly, if, if you would have told me we could have hired a guy who's had four straight uh, draft, draft picks uh, from, from group of five all the way to the Big 12 now, uh, had a, a conference player of the year at, at, at the Sun Belt level, a um, ton of energy, ball of fire, very good evaluator, thorough recruiter. That's what we got in Brian Early, um, a guy who's really worked his way up um, and, and he's got some really good pieces in that room. You know, we added Darius Smith from Georgia. We added Zion Young from uh, Michigan State. We're bringing in Williams Nawari. We're bringing in Jalen Brown. Uh, you got the Cotton Bowl MVP and Johnny Walker. You've got some other guys who are ready to just be developed. And he, he jumped in that room. Um, he, he is a ball of Red Bull every day, just full of energy going. And so very excited about what he's bringing and how that group now is really gelled around their opportunity in front of them. Two more things here. So the patch is right in front of me. The yeah. Cotton Bowl patch is right in front of me. Should have sat it on this side. The mascot, I don't know if people know this, but the mascot they gave you guys is like a full tire rubberized tiger that just sits down in the lobby and mm-hmm. you can smell him when you walk yeah. in. That's how you know it's a good mascot. Yeah. Um, what did that win do for the program? Um, wow. It, it's hard to quantify what exactly that win did for us. I, I think for me it was – it ignited hope for the future, right? It ignited the the hope that we have of competing at the highest level in this conference um, and on the national stage. And and that's why we took the job here. That's why we came to the University of, of Missouri to make it relevant on the national scene. And for us to, to, to play the way we did last year and then to top it off winning that game, to lose the players that we're going to lose to the draft, but then to, to be able to have this next group coming Luther Burden, uh, Armand Mimbu, Brady Cook, uh, uh, Theo Weiss, right? Joseph Charleston, Tristan uh, Newsom, uh, to have these guys ready to, to, to take the baton and carry it forward for this season. I think for me it was just, all right, this is what we can and will be moving forward. Um, and this was the vision we had, and we're just halfway to it. And now we got to really put the foot down. We got to put all of our chips in the middle and really go for it. And, and that's the message that I have to our fan base. That's the message that I have to our team is um, we still have a lot to prove, but now it's time to double down on that commitment. When you guys came out of spring, which you already are yep. pretty early relative to the rest of the country, and you, you start self scouting, self assessing both staff and roster, outside of depth, what are some of the things that you circled with Red Sharpie and said, that's what we got to hammer down on from now until we tee it up against, I think it's Murray State week one? Yeah. What are some of those things that we got to focus on here? Well, I mean, there's technical things. I, I felt like at the line of scrimmage, we were really good on both sides of the ball. Um, but we're always going to have to work on being more physical and creating pressure on the quarterback, right? So from an offensive line standpoint, we want to create a more physical identity. Uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on running the outside zone and that's just requiring reps, reps, reps. We got to replace Cody Schrader who led the SEC in rushing. So we're going to have to work the next four months on establishing that, that ground control. Obviously with Brady Cook and Brett Norfleet, Luther Burden, Theo Weiss, Mookie Cooper, a couple of other guys, you know, we, we should be able to throw the ball with anybody. But in this league, you better win at the line of scrimmage running the football. From the defensive side of the ball, it's all going to be about creating pressure on the quarterback. Um, and we've got some guys there, but we're going to really have to refine our pass rush ability, winning one-on-ones, um, being detailed in our in our pass rush. And, and I think that's what they're going to work on the most. Eli Drinkwitz, we appreciate it, man. M-I-Z. Thank you for having us. Excellent stuff from Missouri head man Eli Drinkwitz. It went like 40 minutes with him. I thought we were 20 or 25 in. The best conversations are like that where you kind of get lost in time. Uh, so we appreciate that with him. Like I said, all the folks at Missouri have been very welcoming today. Pate State Speaker Series on the road. Um, let me fill you in on a little something. We are going to drive over to Kansas State tomorrow, and we will have Chris Kleiman, and we'll exclusively talk to him on this channel. And as you know, we're headed to Iowa State Thursday. And those are just 
some of the first stops on what will be a multi-city, multi-month tour because what else are we going to do? Sit in Nashville all spring? No one wants to do that. So we appreciate it. We've got our crew on the road here. We've got our crew down in Fort Lauderdale punching this entire thing, and we got you, and that's why we can do it. We appreciate you so much. We'll be back Thursday night. Until then, take care, and God bless.